Okay, so welcome to day three, 6912. The class attendance seems to be... Oh, there's hundreds of people here. For the, tell the video people that. that. We had to have an adjunct lecture hall just for the large attendance in this class. Um, so you all read the important parts of the Copyright Act. Um, what were your reactions? Hungy? Yeah, there, I, I felt like a lot of uh, parts of it were very ambiguous. Specifically, what comes to mind is like the fair use section, where they basically say, well, in order to determine if something counts as fair use versus infringement, uh, we're going to look at the nature of this factor, you know, like this factor, this factor, which basically said to me that the court can mostly justify pretty much anything it wanted on, in any given case. Yeah. Uh, I think for us, it was the first failure uh, article, the, the worst thing is that uh, the, the list of examples that is given is said to be illustrative and non exhaustive So, well, you can justify from this that uh, either it's just these kind of uh, examples that are illustrative, or you can justify that basically anything that is not directly uh, commercial is, uh, <coughs> can presumptively uh, be failures. Yeah, I don't know about presumptively fair use. That's pretty strong. But it's true that fair use is pretty ambiguous. And there's a paper that you guys can pull up by Nimmer called The Fairest of Them All, where he takes like, I probably talked about this, he takes like 50 copyright cases that are on fair use. And in each one, he looks at what the judge said was the judge's analysis of the four factors. And it turns out that even what the judge says about the four factors has very little predictive power as to the actual decision on fair use. Sometimes the judge says no to all four factors and it's still fair use. Sometimes he says yes to all four factors and it's not fair use. Uh, there's basically no, um, <coughs> you know, there's, there's little predictive power there. And Hung asks, are most laws that long? So we, let's look at the federal law here on murder. <laughs> Paper on the website? Sure. I, I may even, I would definitely put it on the website. But it's called The Fairest of Them All, if you look it up. Da, da, da. Okay, here's murder. 18, so 18 USC is crimes. That's where they put all the federal criminal laws. Now, by the way, if you commit murder right now, are you going to get charged under this 18 USC 1111? Yeah, the answer is no, because it would be the Massachusetts law on murder that you would fall under. The only time that you have to worry about the federal prohibition on murder is if you are doing it in a military base or some sort of special federal area. Um, or maybe if you're doing it while, you know, on the four corners between <laughs> so, some, but normally it would be the state's responsibility to police things like murder. But here, here's, this is pretty close to what any given state will say. This is the law on murder. Murder. Murder is the unlawful killing of a human being with malice of forethought. Every murder perpetrated by poison, lying in wait, any other kind of willful, deliberate, malicious, and premeditated killing, or committing the perpetration of, or attempting to perpetrate, arson, escape, murder, kidnapping, treason, espionage, sabotage, aggravated sexual abuse or sexual abuse, child abuse, burglary, or robbery, or perpetrated as part of a pattern or practice of assault or torture against a child or children, or perpetrated from a premeditated design unlawfully and maliciously to affect the death of any human being, other than him who is killed is murder in the first degree. Any other murder is murder in the second degree. <laughs> and then there's some other stuff within the special maritime and territorial jurisdiction of the United States. Whoever is guilty of the murder in the first degree shall be punished by death or by imprisonment for life. Here's what assault and child abuse. Okay, that's the end of it. That's the entirety of the federal statute against murder. So, so like the movie Saw, when that person tries to set up the, the person to kill themselves? I don't remember the movie, but there's this movie in which like this guy tries to set these people up so that they kill themselves. Yeah. So that's count. That counts, right? I, I don't know. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I mean, I was just wondering because I don't know if people get away with that. Uh, I think you'd be in big trouble, no matter what the you know tiny the legal consideration, whether it's murder in the first degree or counts as something else. Yeah, I mean, I'm not really an expert on the on the the murder statute, but my point is just. This one seems really important. It's about murder, and yet it's really short. And the other one is about copyright infringement, and it's like 300 pages. So the, the copyright statute is very specific. And what, is that, um, what does that say to you? 
I mean, who, who, who is generally governed by the statute against murder? Who does that affect? Yeah, everyone. None of us can murder. And, and who seems to be the intended audience for the copyright statute? Sorry? More limited. I mean, who, who is it supposed to, um, are, I mean, are you and I supposed to just read the copyright statute and be like, oh, it's OK if it's between 10 years and 20 years and constitutes, you know, I mean, are we supposed to be parsing the definitions of the copyright statute? I mean, do we have to obey the copyright law, or can we infringe copyright willy-nilly? <coughs> yes, you do have to obey, but yeah. It seems like it's most specific when it applies to certain situations like uh, proprietors of commercial establishments and bro broadcasters <coughs> and uh, agricultural fairs. Agricultural fairs. I like, wh what section is the agricultural fairs in? Oh, Section 110. 110, very good. Um, yeah, the copyright law is very specific. And why do you think that is? What sort of what sort of legislative process do you think drove the statute against murder? Do you think that Congress said we're going to have hearings on if we should prohibit murder, and if so, how far should we go? Should we prohibit, you know, tor torture of children, or maybe not? And the lobbyists came in, the pro-child torture lobbyists and the anti-child torture <laughs> lobbyists, and they would have hearings, and then all the various people who make tools that can be used for torture, like Sears Craftsman, saying, well, we shouldn't be held liable just because our tools could be you. OK, we'll have an exemption for you so that the makers of tools, and then that other people will, you know, if the tool has reasonable knowledge, you know, do you think that they had that kind of involved legislative process with carefully wrought out compromises? No. no. But what happens with copyright law? Yeah, lots of companies. Kind of there's, there's a series of carefully wrought compromises among commercial interests. And they're extremely carefully wrought. I mean, these people had a very particular result in mind. So we didn't actually read. Um, <coughs> for instance, if you go into a, into a library, what do you often find there? Books. Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but right when you come in, what's usually at a, at a library? A, a copy machine, yeah. And who gets the pro I mean, is, is it a, usually a free copy machine? No. no. You pay. And who gets the profits from the copy machine? Library. The library. So the library is servicing a machine, and they know that you're copying stuff on it. And they're getting profits from copying. You, you're copying stuff on it. They have all these books. I mean, and it's right by the door, right? So they're saying, come to our library, copy our books, and we will profit off of your malfeasance. That seems. <laughs> Would the library have a, so you guys read the Sony case. Is the library committing contributory infringement? There was an exemption for libraries and others. That was not a sign, the exemption for libraries. <laughs> but very good, there is an exemption for libraries. But without the exemption, are the libraries committing contributory infringement? Was there a lawful use for uh, the copiers otherwise? Wait, is it the library or the copier manufacturer? <laughs> is it the library or the copier manufacturer? That's a good question, but let's just talk about the library. Is there a significant non-infringing use? That's a good question. Yeah, I think that covers the copy of the library. Or like you do your homework and you want to copy your book. Okay. Okay. So, so that would be an argument on behalf of the libraries. What would be the argument against the libraries? They sell books that are copyrighted, and so since they, they uh, propose uh, to copy uh, people just in the same place, they know that uh, some people would uh, uh, would try to co uh, to copy uh, copyrighted uh, works. Yeah, I mean, they, surely they will know of actual legal copying. I mean, the librarian can go there and see that somebody's ripping off some copyrighted book. So it's the library is a little closer to the illegal copying than Sony was, right? Sony was not there in your bedroom while you're illegally building a library of some TV show. So the librarians were worried about this. And so when uh, Congress was amending the law, the librarian says, well, whoa, whoa, we, we, need, we need a little exemption for us to protect us, or else we're not going to, you know, we, we're not going to be quiet about your other, um, you know, other amendments that, you know, other parties in front of Congress wanted. And so Congress passed this Section 108, which is a series of extremely specific exemptions uh, for libraries. And one of them lets them have a, um, a copy machine. Let's see here. Let's see. 
Okay, nothing in this section shall be construed to impose liability for copyright infringement on a library or archives or its employees for the unsupervised use of reproducing equipment located on its premises, provided that such equipment displays a notice that the making of a copy may be subject to the copyright law. So you've, you've, you, know, you remember when you go in the library, they always have that notice, warning, protected by copyright law. You don't? If you go, go again, because they almost always have them. We can take a field trip. Yeah, well, that's for different reasons. But anyway, um, so the point is that the copyright, in one sense, the reason the statute is so long is because it reflects a series of carefully wrought out compromises uh, between different interests. And uh, you know, a lot of times when you know when people do things that disturb those interests, um, you know, people get get they really don't like it because you know they had a certain economic reality in mind, not not just a certain method of regulation in mind. Yeah, so which, what section is the computer program one? Oh, and you, I have your notes. Ah, OK. Well, so it's 117. Here, let me give you your notes back. So what did the, um, so let's talk about computer programs. What is a computer? You put some soft, a disk in the computer, has some software. What does the computer do? It reads it, okay, and what does it do with it? It loads it into memory. It loads it into memory, okay. So you're telling me we put in the disk. This is the disk, right? We put it into the machine, and it copies it into what? It copies it into RAM, right? What is RAM? Okay, and what is it? Okay, how does it? What does it mean to copy it into RAM? How can it be in RAM? Okay, let's talk about something easier. What does a TV station do? You, rec I record you guys with a TV camera, and I broadcast it. What am I doing? Here's the camera. You're telling me I'm sending a signal, so it comes out of here into an antenna, right? I'm sending a signal. What is that signal? First of all, am I making a copy when I'm doing this? Is there any reproduction going on here? No, there's no reproduction. But I am taking something that was over here, could be some copyrighted work, and I'm sending a signal. And what, what is this signal? Come on, you guys took 802. What is it? An electric, and it's an electric field, right? OK. And there's a, it's electromagnetic waves. But am I making a reproduction? No. OK, what am I making? Transmission. A transmission. And which of the exclusive rights does a transmission implicate? Is it distribution? No. Which one is it? Come on, we read the on-command case, right? It's performance, yes. The public performance right. And if we look in 101, it says public performance includes by means of a transmission, remember, to a place open to the public or to a substantial number of people, whether simultaneously or not simultaneously. Remember? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so this, is the, this implicates the performance right. So if I have a license to perform, I'm good to go here, right? Okay, right? Yes? Okay. So now let's talk about what the computer does. You take the disk in, it gets read by some head, and what does it do? Well, before you can copy it into RAM, well, when you copy it into RAM, what happens? It's transmitted? I don't think it's, it doesn't really, it's not, tra the only transmissions that matter are ones that are to the public. Because it's the, it's the public performance right that we're worried about. So that doesn't really get implicated. It copies it in, well, what is RAM? The, the whole bunch of, uh, but how do you make RAM? Transistors. Transistors, no. Capacitors, yes. So how is a bit represented in RAM? OK, so there's a capacitor, and you're telling me they're charged. What does that mean, that there is inside this capacitor? Electrons just sitting there? 
What's in the middle here? <laughs> An electric field, yes. OK. So, um, that, is, that, is that copying though? Well, this one was an electric field. Is this one copying? No. no. And this one's an electric field. Is this one copying? Yes. yes. So, well, really? Are you sure? How do we know that it's copying? <laughs> well, <laughs> it was not so clear. Um, how would we go about answering this question? I mean, is yeah, we have to define what copying is. Well, we have a 300-page statute for that. But you guys can see how if you were motivated just by looking at the technology, you could be led astray here. You could look at the left example and say, electric fields are not copies. Because they're just electric fields. They're, just, they're, not, they're not what? what? What are the words we need to invoke to ask this question? OK, we'll look it up. So where would we look if we wanted to find out what a copy really is? What section? I'll cover up the screen. 101. Why 101? Definitions. Definitions. OK. Copies. Where do you see? Oh, there we go. Copies. OK. OK. Copies are material objects. I don't know. Is this a material object? OK, other than photo records, in which a work is fixed by any method now known or later developed. Now, do we know what fixed really means? It's defined later. Oh, it is defined later. That's amazing. OK. And for, OK, fixed by any method now known or later developed, and from which the work can be perceived, reproduced, or otherwise communicated, either directly or with the aid of a machine or device. OK, so what does fixed mean? We'll go down. OK, a work is fixed in a tangible medium of expression when its embodiment in a copy or phono record is sufficiently permanent or stable to permit it to be perceived, reproduced, or otherwise communicated for a period of more than transitory duration. Oh. A work consisting of sounds, images, or both that are being transmitted is fixed for purposes of this title of, OK, well, that second sentence is, well, let's talk about this for a second. So now we have some information with which to answer this question. We just have to guess. It's only stored for milliseconds. Sorry? It's only stored for milliseconds. I don't know. Is that transitory duration? Well, who's, who thinks that this, is, that this is a copy, that this is fixed? Like six people. OK, who thinks it is not fixed? Two. OK, uh, okay why is it fixed? Because you can do all kinds of stuff with it. You can do all kinds of stuff with it. OK. Like perceive it and all that stuff. OK. Liz, why is it not fixed? I guess I guess I would distinguish between just loading the container and actually writing the program to disk to having a standalone copy of it. I mean, I think that if you if you try to run the program and you load it into memory, it's going to stay in memory for as long as you have the program running. And so I think I would interpret that as more than transitory. I mean, sure, if you turn the computer off, then it's no longer there. But uh, I mean, the fact that you're, you're running the program for an extended period of time suggests that it's it's more than transitory to me. Okay. Let's talk about a third possible thing we could have. Um, who here? Who has a Walkman here? Like a real Walkman. <laughs> Should have taught this class like 10 years ago. No, not an iPod. A real, like a, like a. <laughs> OK. Well, OK, so let's talk about a, so let's emphasize a distinction. So to, 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 um, to transmit a copy of this document, to transmit this document, do you need permission to reproduce the document? Let's ask that question. To do this activity, if you're a TV broadcaster, do you need permission to reproduce the document? No. To, to run a computer program, or, and to read a book, if you get a book, to use that book to read it, do you need permission to do anything? 
Now, you get the book. You don't need anybody's permission to read it, tell a friend about it, anything. But if you get a computer program, do you need somebody's permission to do, um, you know, to, to use it? Well, let's say in the absence of Section 117, would you need somebody's permission to run this program? Or if somebody just gives you a program, can you just use it? Somebody says no. Why not? Well, we just said that this is a reproduction, right? Or the majority of the class, the majority of the Supreme Court of this class said this is a reproduction. <laughs> but let's say it's obtained completely legally. You go to the store, you buy the disc. You go to, if you go to Borders Books and you buy a book, can you read the book without needing anybody else's permission? Yes. If you go to Borders Bookstore and you buy a disc with a computer program on it, can you use the computer program without needing anybody else's permission? Yeah. Well, if this is a reproduction and there's no exemption, could you use the program without getting anybody's permission? The thing is that you need to do it in order to use it. Yeah. So it's very useful. Yes. So he says it's fair use. The statement in, inside the copyright law which states it's legal if you're doing it for the express purpose of running it on a machine. That's section 117. Okay, but that was before that was enacted. Would you need somebody's permission just to get it to to use a disk? If it's copying, then I don't think so. Well, let's say that this RAM copy is a reproduction. <coughs> okay, so here, he, no permission necessary. Here, you can't do anything. Until you get permission. You can't run the program, is what we're saying, unless you have permission from the copyright owner. OK, now let's look at number three. You have a CD here. How does a CD work? Yeah. OK, so there's some pits. There's a laser that goes in, and it gets a bunch of ones and zeros. OK, and then what do we do? OK, we take the ones and zeros. They're digital, right? We take every 16 of them. We turn them into numbers. And we play them at a speaker. OK? Now, is copyright implicated at any point here? No. Do you need the, if you get the CD from Borders Bookstore, do you need anybody's permission to play the CD? No. So we're saying there's no permission necessary here. The only time you need permission is to run a computer program. That's kind of anomalous, isn't it? I mean, if you go to, to Borders and you buy a, let's say, let's take another one. Well, OK. Yeah, let's say you go and you, you get a video cassette. How does this one work? Similar to the CD. There's some sort of signal on here. It's red with a head. It goes, and it connects to your TV. Barney the dinosaur. You watch it with your friends and your family. Do you need anybody's permission to do this? If it's just your friends and family. If it's just your friends and family, no public performance. Same with the CD. Same with the CD. OK. Now, what about that message at the beginning that says, this is licensed for private home use only? Does that change things? Right with the FBI warning. Does that, by the way, does the FBI put on the FBI warning? No. It's just some people put on the FBI warning. It's not put on by the FBI. I mean, I would be more scared of the. Is it copyright infringement? No. I would be more scared of like the KGB warning. If I were going to put a warning on, it would be. Like the Al Qaeda warning or something. That would really scare. If you, they were like, if you copy this VC, VHS tape, Osama is going to come to your house. That would scare me. But they don't do that. They put on the FBI warning. Um, anyway, but do you have to obey what it says? What if it says this is licensed for home use only while you're standing on your head? Would you be legally compelled if you're going to watch the tape? You would have to stand on your head. No. no. So does that notice have any legal effect? It's kind of a trick question, right? What if the notice said, this is licensed for copying? You can copy it as much as you want. Then would it have legal effect? Yeah. Yeah. 
But if it says this is licensed for nothing, you can't watch it at all, then would it have legal effect? So you're telling me that the only way it has legal effect is if it's giving you rights. That seems kind of self-serving. Is that the, the truth, though? Like if they put that warning there, just so that if you do, like if you don't use it properly, if you don't use it legally, they can say like, you know, we didn't put this warning to let you know that. Um, so you're knowingly breaking. Oh, so you're knowingly breaking. Okay, but I think that that's true. By the way, that they, with a notice like that, they can disclaim rights, but they probably cannot reserve further rights to themselves. Well, that's because the, co the copyright statute statute gives you certain rights and. It gives the copyright owner certain rights, and the copyright owner's rights are the ones they can give up. Exactly. So the copyright owner owns these exclusive rights, and they can give them to you if they want. But they can't, uh, without some sort of contract, arrogate further rights to themselves. Uh, and that, ex anyway, sorry. OK, so, so here we're saying no permission necessary to get the VHS tape. Doesn't matter if, even if they say you have to stand on your head, you don't have to. You don't need the permission. For the CD, we're saying no permission necessary. For the broadcast, you say, no, nope, you don't need a permission to reproduce. But only for the computer disk, we're saying, to run the program, you need permission. Now, I, with the Walkman, what new feature to Walkmans did they start adding in like 1994? Anti-skip. Anti -skip. And how does that work? It's not quite like this, is it? Yeah. Make sure you, they look ahead. Please. They look ahead. So instead of having the ones and zeros get turned directly into an analog signal, they take a lot of ones and zeros. And what do they do with them? They store them where? RAM. In RAM, yeah. And then they take it out of RAM and they put it to the speaker. So they're copying it into RAM. So if you buy a Walkman with anti skip, do you need the permission from the singer to use the anti skip feature? No? Why not? It's only transitory. Really? I mean, some, some of these now, how long is the anti-skip buffer on your iPod? Why do you always have a last skip anyways? Oh, they, on iPods, you don't always have Oh, because you don't want to have to use the hard drive. But, OK. Uh, anyway, anti-skip buffers on CDs now can be minutes. I mean, how long do you typically use a computer program? Could be a few minutes, right? OK, it could be a few days. but. So it, I mean, I, <laughs> let's say you're, a, um, you're an attorney, and Sony comes to you, and they say, we want to make the new Discman with the anti-skip feature. It's going to have a 10-minute anti-skip buffer. Uh, can we make it? Or do we need to get permission? You know, do our customers need to get permission to reproduce the work? What are you going to tell them? The customer, you're the lawyer. Sony comes to you. Yeah. I know that uh, the thing uh, has made an, an anti-skip for uh, one hour, basically the whole night. A one-hour anti-skip buffer. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> so if you're the attorney, would you, um, what would you tell Sony with their one-hour anti-skip buffer? I, I think as long as they, uh, the user cannot uh, use the anti-skip without the uh, original disk, Mm -hmm. It would be legal because it would still be transitory. Because as soon as you uh, put the, the disk out, you wouldn't be able to access the uh, RAM memory. Okay, so your standard is going to be if they need. Here's here's the standard that David was it Damien Damien. If they have original disk, That's going to be your standard? Who agrees with the Damien standard? You like that one. OK. Who, who disagrees with the Damien standard? <coughs> so maybe if you, could, if you could load the CD in the anti-skip buffer and then take the CD out and give it to your friend but still play it, then Sony would be in trouble. But you're going to tell them as long as they have to keep the original disk inside there, they're fine. Uh, Similar to the computer one, but like with the computer one, I guess if you take the disk out, it can still work as long as it's already been all the data. So that could provide oh. a difference. It all depends on. It doesn't apply to all the computers. Okay, well, let's, so let's, let's say that Sony takes the Damien advice. And um, do you know what lawyers do, by the way, when they research advice? They charge a lot of money. Well, yeah, they charge a lot of money <laughs> to the first guys, to Sony. 
But what happens, let's say another company comes, let's say Sony got that advice in, let's say, 1995. And uh, this is going to be the, the Damien Law Firm advice. OK, now let's say another customer comes to you. Um, we'll call them Michael Robertson Incorporated. In 1996, two years later, and he says, I'm thinking of creating a new system where um, you know, users buy a lot of CDs. And they're, you know, they're maybe, they don't want to have to take them all over the place. You, know, you go on vacation, you don't have to bring all your CDs to you. So I'm, I'm going to make a new system for my company, the Michael Robertson Company. And it's going to be, if you're in California, uh, you prove to me that you have these disks. You, know, you put them in this special machine that I'll make, and it'll prove to me that you actually own these disks. And then when you go into to vacation in, in Florida, I will um, let you listen to the disks from there with my system. But you have to, you have to, there's no verb in this sentence. We'll make it have. Um, they have to have the original disk. They have to prove it to me by perfect means in order for me to listen, let them listen to it just in a different location. Is that OK? And the Damien Law Firm, so here's what lawyers do. They write what's called an opinion letter, which is generally the exact same opinion that they gave to some other guy. And they build the first guy, you know, that they spent 1,000 hours on it at $1,000 an hour. They build the first guy a million dollars. They just take the same letter, they change the, like, the, who they're writing it to, and they sell it to the second company also for a million dollars, even though they didn't do any more work. They just sold the letter again. That's called an opinion letter. Um, so when you all become lawyers, well, you can get in trouble with these things, as some law firms have. Anyway, the point is you sell the new company, Michael Robertson's company, a million dollar opinion letter that says you're fine as long as you make sure customers have the original disk. Because it's the same thing uh, as the anti-skip buffer. And by the way, who is Michael Robertson? Anybody heard of Michael Robertson? No? He's an entrepreneur. He started a bunch of companies. Um, he started one that was called mp3.com in the mid-90s. And they created a service called Beamit. That was, you could go to it, my.mp3.com. And you'd have to put a disk in your drive and prove to this company that you actually own the disk. And then when you went somewhere else, uh, Michael, the, the company would stream the disk to you. So you have to prove that you owned it. That's a good question. The question is, are they streaming it from your disk that you left in your computer, or are they streaming it from them? Well, the answer is they're streaming it from them. Uh, they had a, you know, a lot of servers in California, and they took a lot of disks, and they copied them to their servers. Uh, and then when you come in and you say, oh, I, you have your own copy of the disk, here's you, and here's their company, and here's you. You, you prove to them that you own this disk, and then they say, OK, now you're authorized to listen to our copy of the disk, and we'll stream it to you wherever you are. And um, so were the record companies happy with this? Did they say, oh, more ways for people to enjoy our products. People are going to buy more CDs. We're thrilled, Michael Robertson. Is that what the record companies probably said? No. Probably not, no. Why were they unhappy? Well, they had a computer program that it was, a, it was pretty good at proving that you had the disk. It would, you know, this company knew exactly what was on the disk, right? So they would say, what's in sector number 437? They'd ask that question to you. And you'd have to prove that you knew what was in sector 437. And the, the request would change each time. So you, you, could very, you could prove pretty well that you had the disk. Or you might have borrowed the disk. You might have borrowed the disk. OK. Or you might have made copies, whatever. Yeah, OK. I mean, do we think that this was taking away from profits of the record labels? You know, did they say, we want people to have to buy a different copy when they're on vacation in Boston from when they're at home in California? So that's why we're not happy. It's taking away with our profits from the crucial vacation rebuying market. Is that why they were unhappy? No. Why were they unhappy? I mean, did the VCR take away from the profits of the movie studios? Which one? Michael Robertson service? I don't know. I think, I don't know actually. I think that it was probably not. I mean, how else would they pay for it? Does anybody know? Did anybody use Beamit? No. I think it was not free. So did the VCR take away from the profits of the 
um, movie studios. Does anybody know when they release a movie right now, who, like The Island, uh, and, you know, it makes $50 million in the theaters. How much does it typically then make in uh, DVD rentals and sales? Generally, at least as much as it made in the theater. They now make more money from, from VCR and DVD sales and rentals than they do from in the theater. So the home VHS systems and DVD systems have been a, a big boon to the movie industry. Now, of course, the movie industry might say, oh, we have no problem with the playback feature of the VCR. What we don't like is people's ability to record things. So maybe it's not quite the same thing. But anyway, in fact, the VCR, even though the movie studios lost that case, has been you know, the best thing that ever happened to Hollywood. But they were still opposed to it. Why? They're not getting profits from it. They don't have control over it. And that's very scary to them. Because they envision a world where, uh, in the future, Britney Spears will release one CD. Or uh, you know, they'll, they'll release you know, the new, I don't know, Jurassic Park 4. And uh, they'll, re they'll sell one DVD of it. And somebody will put it on Napster, Kazaa, and then everybody else will just get it from them. And they won't be able to recoup their investment. Now, is that a justifiable fear? Who here has not used Napster, Kazaa, or Grokster, or LimeWire, or one of those services? Ever. Okay, one, two people have never used them. So the rest of us have, in some way, validated that fear. Um, so they're really concerned about losing control. And they were very concerned about losing control here. And so they, they sued mp3.com. Even though you can say, oh, it's the best thing that ever happened to you. you know, they, these companies don't like to be told what the best thing is to ever happen to them. They generally like to decide that for themselves. So, um, so they sued mp3.com. And what argument do you think they made? Yeah. My mp3.com uh, is using one of their disks. So they are, they are broadcast some, or some kind of uh, public trans transmission. Yeah, well, it turns out they had a license for the public performance, or at least they, they sort of did. So they didn't get them on public performance. But what did they get them on? What has this whole conversation been about? Reproduction. That's right. So they got them on this reproduction. And mp3.com said, come on, it's fair use. These people, we, we went by the day. They actually, by the way, did, they, this company did go to an outside law firm, and they did get advice. And uh, they believed that they would be OK on this if they have the original disk, that that would be the advice that would save them. That was like a mantra in the company. It's like, if they have the original disk, we'll be fine. Um, and some of the programmers were like, this all came out in the, in the lawsuit. The programmers were like, can we maybe go to another law firm? Because it would really suck to do all this work and then have the company go out of business. And you know, the in-house lawyer was like, no, we're fine. If they have the original disk, you'll be fine. It's the same thing. <laughs> that was the argument. And uh, so they went to court on that. And, uh, and they said, look, this reproduction, it doesn't matter, because they have the original disk. And uh, the judge said, um, no. This copy, this systematic copying of 200,000 CDs is just no. It's a reproduction. It's a systematic reproduction. It's for commercial gain. It's not fair use. And there's no other exemption. So no. They lost. And they did go out of business. They went bankrupt. And they got bought by some other company. And there is now an mp3.com, but I don't think it's Michael Robertson anymore. But Michael Robertson then went out and found a company called Lindos that made a Linux competitor to Microsoft Windows. He got sued by Microsoft. And uh, I think Microsoft ended up paying him to change his name to Linspire. Uh, and then now he has a new company where he's hired as an employee a guy named John Johansson, who's a, we'll get to him later, but another troublemaker from Norway. So that, that's what this Michael Robertson guy does. But anyway, so the mp3.com, they got advice from the Damien Law Firm. It was like a mantra in the company, and they still lost. Um, so what does that say about anti-skip buffers? Same thing. <laughs> is it the same thing? It's a good question. Um, I mean, I don't know. I wish I could sue somebody over my laptop. I don't. I mean, I don't know if it's the same thing. That's the point. In fact, um, MIT, you know, MIT's law firm Fish and Richardson uh, in Boston uh, has all sorts of copyright experts, and they once had a client who asked them about anti-skip buffers. And um, what do you think the lawyer's answer was? 
Actually, I don't know what the lawyer's answer was. I mean, I can't really tell you. I mean, because I, I don't know, because they wouldn't tell me. But my guess is that the answer was that they don't know. And they probably still, they were like, we don't know in a million dollars, please. That's <laughs> probably the answer. That's what you could do when you're a lawyer. But I mean, they're really, I mean, can you answer these questions like clearly? A judge can give a clear answer to these questions, right? A judge can say yes or no or guilty. Uh, but nobody else can really answer these questions. And um, even the preeminent copyright scholar in, in the US, David Nimmer, you know, he has this whole treatise. And you can go to Harvard, the Harvard Law Library and look at it. And it's 10 volumes. It's like this big on the bookshelf. And they, he comes out with a new version like every four months. So you'll look on the front. It'll say version 68. And every three months, there's a new version. And they splice in more pages. And he has voluminous writings about every part of this copyright statute. And it's, he's fantastic. Um, I'll show you. But, um, you know, and, and, so, and Nimmer will write things about like how hypothetical future cases should be decided. And then the judges, you know, when they get those cases, will say, well, we just disagree with Nimmer. And then, uh, and then Nimmer will write in the next version of his treatise, this case was wrongly decided. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there's nothing you can do, even if you're the preeminent copyright scholar. And supposedly, the when there's these conferences that, and Nimmer is there, the judges supposedly come up to Nimmer and they say, hey, I just decided this recent case. Uh, did I get it right? But, which is sort of the reverse of how things should be, since Nimmer is supposed, you know, supposed to be describing copyright law. Um, but anyway, so the, nobody really knows is the point I'm trying to make. And if you're in a company that's banking its future on the, this kind of theory, you, know, you, uh, you should be concerned. OK, so um, with computer programs, nobody knew the answer to this until there was a case called MAI, um, which we didn't read, but you can pull it up. And um, there was a company with a computer. And this is in the early 90s, right? So it, the likelihood that the judge has used a computer might be, um, it's not clear that the judge in this case would have ever used a computer. And that, that sometimes produces very interesting answers because, anyway. The, so there's a case called MAI. And one company had produced the software for the device. And they had a service contract to service the computer and its software. And the customer abruptly switched and said, we're going to have a different company service the software. And that company had to load the software into RAM you know, to run it. And uh, they went to court. And uh, MAI, well, th the decision was that loading it into RAM does create a reproduction. And you do need the copyright owner's permission to do that. Um, Yes, I mean, you have the right to. Yeah. Yes, because owning a copy of the program, just like owning a copy of the CD, doesn't mean you have permission to copy the CD. And owning a copy of the program does not give you permission to reproduce the program. Um, so, and and what was the eventual result in this case, as you read in the homework? Then you can make a copy of RAM if you require to make the program run. So they they. So Congress stepped in and they said, well, this is not what we intended. And they reversed the decision of the, the in a limited sense, they reversed the decision by um, changing Section 117, which is the one that governs computer programs. And they said, uh, if it, well, we'll pull it up. So they amended it to say, um, here we go, notwithstanding, I love that word, notwithstanding the provisions of section 106, which are the core rights, it is not an infringement for the owner or lessee of a machine to make or authorize the making of a copy of a computer program if such copy is made solely by virtue of the activation of a machine that lawfully contains an authorized copy of the computer program for purposes only of repair or maintenance of that machine if, oh, is this the one we're talking about? I think I read the wrong one. Where is it? OK, here we go. So that maintenance one is like the MAI case. But there's another exemption. This is notwithstanding, it is not an infringement for the owner of a copy of a computer program to make or authorize the making of another copy or adaptation of that computer program, provided that such a new copy or adaptation is created as an essential step in the utilization of the computer program in conjunction with the machine, and that it is used in no other manner. Or, and the second one is you can make a backup copy. Now, what can we note about these exemptions? 
Can you make a backup copy of your DVD or your music? Yes? I always say you can. Yeah, well, does it say you can? Yeah, well, it says only of a computer program. It is not infringed with the owner of a copy of a computer program to make or authorize the making of another copy. So it doesn't say anything that you can copy um, a DVD or music or a book. Right. There might be another section that says you can make a backup copy of music or games or something else. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I didn't mean to say game. Music or a movie or a book. Um, You could argue once it's an electronic form, everything's a program. It's the same thing. Well, it's a good question. What do you think the judge would say? Well, do you have the right to put the strings into your program? Yeah, I think he would not be successful with that kind of argument. I think that there is a definition of what is a computer. Oh, there's a definition. Oh, we don't have to just guess. That's a novel but interesting approach. Okay, so the point is that there's no, I, I, there's no other section that grants a backup right to anything. This is the only thing about backup rights in the Copyright Act. So when you hear people saying, oh, you can make a backup of your, of your music, that, that's not so. There's no, well, <laughs> yeah, there's no explicit right to make a backup of your music. Um, what about, anybody play those old Nintendo, like you go on the website and they have all the Nintendo ROMs, and what do they say on those? If you delete them within 24 hours, it's OK. Is that true? No. So do people just make stuff up about copyright? Yeah, yeah. They also sometimes say that, oh, you have to have the original game, and this is for our catalog purposes. You have to have the original game. Does that, is that a good argument? Well, we don't really know. But uh, probably that argument is not what lawyers call dispositive, meaning it doesn't close out the inquiry. Uh, it doesn't answer the question. Okay. So, um, and and in, you know, if you want to, so this this question about is copying a disk into RAM for a computer program. Now we know the answer. Uh, it does not infringe the exclusive right of reproduction. But for other kinds of copyrighted works like um, music or movies or whatever, we we still don't really know the answer. And the MAI uh, decision is probably still good law. Now. You know what do you what do you think the parties probably argued about in the MAI decision? We we're looking at that definition just a second ago. They argued about whether it was a fixation and whether it was you know for transitory duration or for longer or you know could it be perceived or reproduced? They were arguing about the definitions of the statute and the, the argument that some of you made that well you can do stuff with it. That was the one that carried the day. Okay, what did you guys think of section 109? What would be the what what would be be like if we didn't have section 109? What would be the law? You would have to ask for permission to like resell a book. To resell a book, yeah, or not even sell. What if I'm like this? Did I would I have just broken the law? Yeah, because I you know I'd be I'll do it here. Here you go. I'd be distributing this copyrighted work, right? So a any kind of distribution of a copyrighted work, I mean, that's presumptively an exclusive right of the copyright owner. So only Section 109 makes what I just did legal. Otherwise, there'd be the FBI in here like, like that. Um, but what doesn't Section 109 make legal? I mean, you might assume that, oh, because I own a book, I can, of course, sell it at my, you know, um, my garage sale and all that. But is that necessarily true? You can't rent. Can you rent a book? If, if you're a non-profit education institution, or library, that's an exception. Anybody can rent a book. Uh, yeah, they really make this complicated here. Let's see. Um, so this is saying, notwithstanding the provisions of section 106.3, which one is 106.3? Distribution. Distribution. The owner of a particular copy or phonorecord lawfully made under this title, or any other person authorized by such owner, 
is entitled, without the authority of the copyright owner, to sell or otherwise dispose of the possession of that copyright or phonorecord. So what's one thing that we should notice here? Who is entitled to uh, use this exemption? Is anybody who has the, the book entitled? No. It's the owner. So if you just, if somebody just lent you the book, you can't lend it to somebody else. You have to be the owner. And that's kind of strange, isn't it? What if I lend you the book and say, it's OK with me if you lend it to somebody else? Then can you lend it? Ah, you guys tricked me out there. OK. <laughs> Fair enough. OK. Well, what if when you get the book from the bookseller, they say, we're not selling you the book. We're just lending it to you forever. Uh, then w would you be able to resell it? No. Not authorized. No. In fact, what are copyrighted works that are frequently distributed exactly like that? Computer programs, exactly. When you buy a commercial computer program, they say, you're not the owner of this program. You're just the licensee. And courts have, con we're not, I don't think we're going to be able to go into the whole details of software licensing in this class, which is an extremely intricate area of the law. Um, by the way, on which the foremost authority is Raymond Nimmer, a different Nimmer. There's no relation to David Nimmer, the copyright expert. David Nimmer is in Los Angeles and is an expert on copyright. Raymond Nimmer, I think, is in Houston and is an expert on software licenses. They have nothing to do with each other. They probably hate each other. But anyway, so we're, we're probably not going to get into that. But yeah, when you buy a computer program, it says you are not the owner. You are just getting to use it in exchange for money. Um, and is the Section 117 exemption, who is that available to? Is it anybody who's got the computer program? Are you looking? Uh, Owner or lessee? Yeah, so I, I don't think that, um, I don't think the rights of Section 117 are available to people who only have the software through one of these, a modern end user license agreement. So you have to be very careful. We can, you know, we can blithely talk about what Section 117 gives you, but unless you look at the absolute specifics, you might be misled. But anyway, so this one is just about the owner or person authorized by the owner is entitled to sell or otherwise dispose of the possession of that copyright or phone, copy or phono record. What's a phono record, by the way? It's like a CD or a record. It's, it's any uh, object in which sounds are fixed. What's the difference between a sound recording and a phono record? A, a sound recording is the thing. It's like a play. Uh, and so if you, if you had a play, you could have the play, which is the work, and it's fixed in a copy of the play. And similarly, you have a sound recording, which is the work, and it's fixed in the phono record. The phono record is a real thing. OK. So notwithstanding the preceding sentence, I love when they do that. So this is two notwithstandings. Um, copies or phono records of works subject to a restored copyright under Section 104A. And where does 104A come from? It, it comes from NAFTA. So what's NAFTA? It's the free trade. It's the free trade North American Free Trade Act agreement, something like that. I don't know. It comes from NAFTA and, and from similar international agreements. Um, so, subject to a restored copyright on Section 104A that are manufactured. Blah, 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 blah. So, there's this whole complicated thing here. Uh, very complicated thing. Cannot be, cannot be disposed of. So, the, the practical effect of that. Section of the statute is if the book that you want to sell at your garage sale is on this list that was published in the Federal Register 15 years ago, then you can't sell it at your garage sale. And so, okay, so that's one limitation. Number two, notwithstanding, again, unless authorized by the owners of copyright in the sound recording or the owner of copyright in a computer program, and in the case of a sound recording in the musical work embodied therein, what's the difference between a sound recording and a musical work? So you guys all read the statute. Is that like the uh, actual, I guess the, the notes and stuff, the musical work is just the sound recording of someone playing the musical work? Yeah, exactly. 
So this is like what a musical works looks like. Ooh, baby. This is a musical work. And then the sound recording is, you know, Britney Spears actually singing that song. So who has the copyright on this, the musical work? The person who wrote the song, Martin Sandberg. And uh, who has the copyright on the sound recording? Probably not Britney Spears herself. I mean, Tom is making a recording of me right now, right? Who has the copyright on that sound recording? <laughs> Whoever paid for it, says Tom. But it's not me, right? I'm not making the recording. Um, OK. But uh, by the way, can it be, um, oh, I won't get into that. Um, OK, I will. If you're, um, let's say the Wall Street Journal calls you. Let's say you're an illustrator. The Wall Street Journal calls you and they say, we're writing an article tomorrow about money. We've never done this before. So we need some picture to illustrate the article. And could you please draw us an illustration on the theme of money? Uh, and you, you draw the illustration with your own tools. And um, then you, you know, the Wall Street Journal pays you 150 bucks. Illustrators do not make a lot of money. And uh, you send it to the Wall Street Journal, and they print in the paper. Who owns the copyright on that illustration? No. You do. You own the copyright. Um, you're the artist. Okay, now let's say you actually work for the Wall Street Journal in New Jersey, and uh, you're, you, people read the Wall Street Journal. How do they, when they have a picture of a person, what does it look like? The little stipple portraits, yeah. Uh, so your, bo your boss comes to you and says, okay, we're writing an article tomorrow about President Bush. We've never done this before, so we need a portrait of President Bush. And you take your Wall Street Journal pen, and you use your Wall Street Journal easel and your Wall Street Journal paper, and you're sitting in your Wall Street Journal office, and you make a picture of President Bush, and they print it in the paper tomorrow. Who owns the copyright on that portrait? The Wall Street Journal. Why? What's the difference? And you can sign it. You sign a contract when you get on the board. Well, one is a freelancer. One is a freelancer or a contractor. The other is an employee. Exactly. And when you're an employee, it's called a work made for hire. And the rules on ownership of works made for hire are um, they're just different. So if you're, if you're an employee doing something within the scope of your employment, that's a work made for hire. And then the copyright is owned by the company. It lasts like 120 years because the company doesn't die. So they, it can't, the, the normal rule is 70 years after you die, right? 120 years, 90 years to life. 90 from, 90 from, from 95 years from publication. Okay. So, um, so the rules are different. Now, uh, you can see how there might be an argument here. What if you're using, what if they give you the pens, but you're working out of your home? What if you're, you're in their office, but with your own pens? You know, you can see how there could be arguments about, are you a contractor or are you an employee? And they have those arguments. Now, but Britney Spears, she's not an employee of the record company, right? She has a contract, so she's probably more like a contractor. Yeah, but on the other hand, the contract can uh, uh, just specify that the uh, copyright will, will belong to the, to the uh, Recording company. So he says a contract can specify that the copyright will belong to the company that's paying. Is that universally true? What, can we think of a contract where that's definitely the case? What kinds of companies contract for works to be written and it's indisputable that it's a work made for hire? Well, how about like a translation? Victor Hugo writes um, The Hunchback of Notre Dame and uh, The Publisher. So that was a bad example. Let's think of a more modern book. Which one? I was thinking like a book where you like, like Pixar, like people like animation pictures and stuff like that. Like their works are for Disney, but it's not for Disney. Like Pixar is for Disney. Okay, well, so let's talk about like a modern book. Like, what was a big hit book? The Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye, that's a really popular book. So his publisher, I don't know which, which publisher it is, but they want to release the German edition of the book. So they hire some guy in Germany to write the translation. And that guy in Germany write, makes the translation with his own pen and his own knowledge of German. Um, but who is probably going to own the copyright there? Probably the, the same publisher as the original work. And they're going to have a term in the agreement that this is a work made for hire. Yeah? It, uh, the, uh, 
is he actual um, is, is he a writer because well it's a uh, the, the derivative work well that's a good question too uh, but let's so let's look at what a work made for hire can be a work made for hire is one a work prepared by an employee within the scope of his or her employment so we talk about that one. And you can see all sorts of ways to argue about that. Like what if you do it on your off hours? Like you're the stipple portrait artist for the Wall Street Journal. But then after the workday is done, some executive comes to you and says, hey, can you do a picture for me on the side? And you know, from 8 PM to 9 PM, you do a little stipple portrait of the executive in your Wall Street Journal office with your pens, but not within the scope of your employment. Who owns the copyright on that? I don't think it's really so clear cut if you're using their pens in their office. and. Outside regular hours? I don't know. When I was at the Wall Street Journal, I regularly had to stay there until like 9 PM. So I don't know if it's outside the hours. You could really argue about that. I mean, we don't really know. OK, that's one. That one's the simple one. Two, a work specially ordered or commissioned for use as a contribution to a collective work. So that's like if there's a journal and they're like, we really want you to write a little introduction on the subject of flies. Somebody does it. That could be a work made for hire. OK, as part of a motion picture or other audiovisual work, that's like your Pixar. Three, a translation. Four, a supplementary work. Five, as a compilation. So that's like, we want you to collect a lot of the work of this author and make a compilation, but you're not going to get the copyright on the compilation. As an instructional test, text, as a test, as answer material for a test, or as an atlas. If the parties expressly agree in a written instrument signed by them that the work shall be considered a work made for hire. So this is what Damon was talking about. If you agree that it's a work made for hire, it can be a work made for hire if it's on this particular list of kinds of works, which are collective, motion picture, translation, supplementary, compilation, instructional text, test, answer material, or atlas. Those, that's the list. Nothing else. That's the audiovisual work. What's an audiovisual work? No, 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 no. That's, that, this is sound recording. There's no visual. That is totally different. Such as a clip. Such as a what? A clip. Like a, from a movie? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, those are under a total different regime. But, um, but we're talking just about the sound recording here. So, so, um, so Britney Spears' recording is probably not a work made for hire, because it can't be unless she's an employee. Now, who, who's probably pissed off at this? The record companies, yeah. And there's a number of reasons. One is that if something is uh, not a work made for hire, now Britney Spears, of course, doesn't actually own the copyright on this song, right? She transferred it to her record company. But the rules say that if you transfer something to another company, 35 years later, you have the right to take it back, no matter what you said 35 years ago. That's in the Copyright Act, unless it's a work made for hire. Yeah, what? So all the recording artists and uh, songwriters are you know, relishing at the prospect. So by the way, there haven't been a lot of works like this, because it hasn't really been. I mean, they, the, that 35-year that thing probably came into effect like 1972 or 1976. So it hasn't really been 35 years. So they're just starting to see the very beginning of these 35-year claims. So it, it won't be, it'll be a long time before ooh, you know, the baby one more time could be subject to that. But the, the the songwriters and recording artists are relishing at the prospect of being able to take back the copyright to their works, even though they signed them away already. But they can't do that if their work's made for hire. So the record companies went to Congress in 1999, and they said, look, we have a contract with these people. It says their work's made for hire. The contract has, you know, it doesn't have any effect because the law doesn't give force to that provision. But um, we would like you to amend the law so that it could be a work made for hire. And Congress did that. They didn't have any hearings or any debate. They tucked it into a law called the Satellite Home Viewer Act. <laughs> um, and OK, what was the predictable result? Um, the artists, the artists were, well, they counter sue who they sue. They didn't sue anybody. I mean, you can't really sue. But they were outraged. They said, you can't just go to the Congress and change the law and call it the Satellite Home Viewer Act. It's got nothing to do with satellites. And furthermore, we have the God-given right to take back our copyrights 35 years later. Now, does that seem right? 
I mean, when we're talking about intellectual property in the first class. It doesn't really seem, the most property, you, if you sign away, you're right. You signed it away. You can't sign it away and then say, oh, even though I signed it away, notwithstanding that, 35 years later, I'm going to take it back. <laughs> but copyright, you can. And, the, the, and the, um, the songwriters and the recording artists said, look, screw the Atlas writers. Those, the, those Atlas writers are just a lower form of life. We don't care if the Atlas writers don't have the ability to take their works back, or the translators, or the, uh, the motion picture people. Screw the actors and the, and the screenwriters. But we, the songwriters, we're of a holy order, and we have the God-given right to take it back. How dare you do that? But it wasn't songwriters who were involved, by the way. It was just sound recordings that were added. Um, so, so, and so the, the, that fury cowed Congress into repealing what they had just done less than a year before. So now it gets very complicated because for about six months, the law said a sound recording could be a work made for hire, but then they repealed it. And they didn't want to have it just be for six months that, um, that they would be works made for hire. So they wanted to sort of retroactively repeal it. But you can't really do that either because the record companies would rightfully own the copyrights. You know, they would rightfully be works made for hire for that six month period. And you can't just take it away from them. Or maybe you can't. So, um, so they had to put this whole complicated thing in here, which is, in determining whether any work is eligible to be considered a work made for hire under paragraph 2, neither the amendment contained in section 1011D of the Intellectual Property and Communications Omnibus Reform Act of 1999, as enacted by section, you see how complicated it is, by 1000A9 of Public Law 106.113, nor the deletion of the words added by the amendment <laughs> shall be considered or given any legal significance, or shall be interpreted to indicate congressional approval of or approval or disapproval of or acquiescence in any judicial determination by the courts or the Copyright Office. Paragraph 2 shall be interpreted as if both Section 2A1 of the Work Made for Hire and Copyright Corrections Act of 2000, that's a very diplomatic name for it, the Copyright Corrections Act, and Section 1011D of the Intellectual Property and Communications Omnibus Reform Act of 1999 is enacted by Section 1089 of Public Law 106.113, were never enacted. And without regard to any inaction or awareness by the Congress at any time of any judicial determinations. So they're like, we want a do-over. Just forget the whole thing. So anyway, that's the case with works made for hire. OK. So we were talking about section 109. Oh yeah, so 109 says that you can, what, is this is 109? Yep, 108. Here we go. OK, so notwithstanding the fact that you can do it, unless authorized by the owners of copyright in a sound recording or in a computer program, and in the case of a sound recording, the musical work embodied therein, neither the owner of a particular phonorecord nor any person in possession of a particular copy of a computer program may, for the purposes of direct or indirect commercial advantage, give it to anybody else by rental, lease, or lending, or by any other act or practice in the nature of rental, lease, or lending. So you can't lend uh, a sound recording. You can't lend a computer program. What can you lend? A book? Yeah, what else? What do, what do people rent all the time? Movies, yeah. So you, if you're a blockbuster, you can rent the movie all you want, but you cannot rent a CD. That's kind of a weird. Well, nothing in the preceding sentence, so that now we're in a third level of notwithstanding. Nothing in the preceding sentence shall apply to the rental, lease, or lending of a phono record for nonprofit purposes by a nonprofit library or nonprofit educational institution. So you can you can borrow from a library because of this triple exemption. You can rent video games. Uh, that's true, because here we have a, a, another triple exemption, which says this subsection does not apply to, uh, the, to a computer program embodied in or used in conjunction with a limited purpose computer that is designed for playing video games and may be designed for other purposes. So you can rent, you can't rent PC video games, but you can rent like an Xbox video game. OK. And then uh, there's a lot of other stuff here. OK, so th the point is that you know people just sort of assume that, oh, I've got the work. I can give it to somebody else. 
Um, but you know, it's subject to all these complicated exemptions. So a blockbuster can just buy a tape and then start renting it? Absolutely. Like, could I buy a tape and rent it? Absolutely. Okay. Um, now, Blockbuster used to actually used to do that. They used to just buy the tape and start renting it. But they had some problems because you, they, you know, they wanted to, first of all, they couldn't get enough copies of the tape. And the movie studios quickly realized what was going on. And so they would say, OK, for the first six months or the first three months that this movie is out on tape, we're going to sell it for 100 bucks a copy. And they, they we'll call this the rental period. And then after the three months, then we'll start selling it for 10 bucks a copy. So Blockbuster would be able to buy the tape. But if they wanted it early, they'd have to pay you know, 100 bucks per copy. And then they might only have two copies, and it wouldn't be in stock. And so Blockbuster. By the way, who owns Blockbuster? It's mostly owned, or it was owned, by Viacom, which is this huge media conglomerate that also owns Paramount Pictures and MTV and Nickelodeon and CBS and uh, Simon and & Schuster. And uh, so Blockbuster, with their partners at Paramount, they went to the other movie studios and they said, look, guys, you know, we're not out to screw you. We make money from movies. You make a heck of a lot of movie for money from rentals. Why don't we reach a deal here? Well, you'll give us unlimited copies of the movie, and we'll just share the profits with you. So they eventually did that. So, but the smaller movie studios who don't have the clout to negotiate those kinds of agreements, they just buy a copy and they rent it. And that's why you'll sometimes see on Amazon when they're selling a, you know, a DVD, you know, it'll be for $100. And you're like, how can this be? But it's because it's still in the period when uh, they, you know, they want to, it's still in the initial period when it's available. OK, but um, for instance, if I um, have a song on my hard drive, can I um, give it to you by emailing it to you and then deleting it from my copy? Is that, is that covered by this exemption? If I have a, a CD that I own, can I just give it to you? Assuming it's not on that list of NAFTA works. If I have a CD, can I just give it to you? Yeah, totally. Even if I am making money off it, I can sell it to you, right? I just can't rent, lease, or lend it. Okay, but if I have a MP3 file on my hard drive that's legally obtained, let's say I got it from the iTunes Music Store or something, can I email it to you and delete it from my own hard drive? Is that am I distributing it to you? You don't know. You did so. Yang Yi says you did make a copy, but you said you were deleting it afterwards. It sounds like you made a copy. Yeah. Well, you should. Yeah, but then you didn't have to delete it. Is there a way to transfer it without making a copy? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah, but so maybe not exactly iTunes. Um, yeah. Well, so there is a case. Uh, and this was an amazing case, okay, where the somebody took a master, an LP master. People know what an LP is. It's this vinyl disc that. So they took an LP master and they distributed it by carving the pits out of it, carving the actual coating off of it, and transferring it onto some other LP, maybe to improve the quality or something. And as an essential step in carving out the front of the disc, they had to destroy the original. Um, and the court held that that was not a reproduction. If it's, you know, as an essential step in the transfer, you destroy the original. Uh, but in this case, when I email it to you, it's not really an essential step to destroy it, is it? So it's, it's not a distribution. And there's no, e even though it's, it, it seems like the same thing, um, it's, it's not really. So when you email songs, it's not, um, it, it, it is a reproduction. Now, what about just streaming? Uh, you know, you've got something on your iTunes, uh, in your iTunes, and I'm on this in the same dormitory as you, so I can it lets you just stream it, right? Is that a reproduction? I'm sorry. Yeah. I think he's talking about just iTunes. Yeah, let's just talk about iTunes. By the way, okay, sorry, yeah. So, so is that uh, making a reproduction or not? How does that work? Buffering. Say again. Buffering. Buffering. Yeah. So now you're worried about anti-skip buffers. Okay. Um, the um, 
the law is not totally clear as to whether those are supposed to be reproductions or not. But almost all parties, well, it's just not clear. Yeah. Sure. Um, for lamp, do you guys have uh, the right to reproduce seeds? No. Okay. I, I think we'll talk about lamp today. I'll try and get to lamp. But um, so the law is actually, I, I went, <laughs> the answer with the iTunes is um, really confusing. Uh, Congress has sort of reached an informal deal that, uh, sorry, I'm, this is just for my own notes. <laughs> I'll put it here. Congress has reached an informal deal. Whoops. Co Congress has, has tried to reach a deal where internet streaming that is on demand, they will consider to be a reproduction. And internet streaming that is not on demand, they want to be not a reproduction. Um, that, well, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> so is the difference between uh, a personal copy of something and an existing radio, public radio, where you don't control the playlist? Yeah. Well, the, 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 the intent of Congress, I mean, what Congress seems to have intended is that if, the, if, you're, if it's like iTunes and you can choose what the person is going to stream to you, that that is supposed to involve a reproduction, probably. And, but if it's just a sort of an internet radio station, which is covered by a whole separate licensing regime, as you talk about, that that is not supposed to be a reproduction. But there's no uh, technical difference between what's used for one and what's used for the other, right? They're both, they'll use real audio or the same kind of streaming. So it's not clear how it could really make a difference. Um, and so I went to the library and looked at what we can, let's see what the law Well, anyway, I, w I looked at the library at what Nimmer said about that. And he said, here's what he says. He says, more confusing than clarifying is the statutory reference to a real-time, non-interactive subscription transmission. The qualified nature leads to the question, how should one treat either an interactive or a non-subscription transmission in real time, even in a context in which no reproduction is made? And he just to jump to the conclusion, he says, it seems to bear out Murphy's law that by striving too hard to make everything perfectly clear, one inevitably injects ambiguity into the mix. So we don't really know whether um, getting something from iTunes involves a reproduction or not. Let's say that it doesn't. Um, is it legal? Your neighbor down the hall is playing some music kind of loud, um, and you're just listening to it. Is that, is that legal? Yes. Why? You don't ask to uh, <laughs> to it disappears. You're not yeah. part of the intended audience. You're not part. Oh, I see. Okay. So, so maybe it's legal. So fine. So now you're streaming it from your neighbor down the hall to your own computer. Is that a? Wh wh how would we answer the question if that's legal? Well, what? What? So what right would he need? Yeah, it's the performance right that we're talking about. They signed, like, I, I know that I did sign a deal with the record companies to make sure that like, only like, big people are signed to the system. Yeah. That's how they can deal with So the way iTunes works is that it lets anybody sort of in your subnet stream your music. So when you, if you're on uh, in East Campus and you're on the first floor on the north side of East Campus and you're streaming something from somebody on the fifth floor on the south side, um, I mean, what's, is that a public performance? What's the, we read the on-command case. What was the, the rubric there? That it was, why? Well, what are the limits on a, who can, who can be there for public performance? Well, they're all social acquaintances. They're all, what Steve says, they're all social acquaintances. <laughs> the language is friends and social acquaintances, right? Or family and its social acquaintances? So I have 101 here. Um, to perform or display a work publicly means uh, to perform or display it at a place open to the public or at any place where a substantial number of persons outside of a normal circle of a family and its social acquaintances is gathered, or to transmit or otherwise communicate it to that sort of place. Mm 
Yeah. So I don't know, is all of East Campus really a normal circle of a family of social acquaintances? <laughs> or a more normal dorm? Is that a normal circle of a family of social acquaintances? <laughs> What about, there's, there's programs that let you use iTunes over the whole, all of MIT, right? I thought you had to be on the same network. Well, but there's programs that bridge the networks, right? So are those now, do we think, starting to break the law? What about all of the internet? You can stream music from anybody else on the internet. Is that definitely illegal? So just because iTunes lets you do it doesn't really make it legal, right? I think a lot of people assume that just because it's in iTunes, it must be legal. But in fact, iTunes will let you break the law. Um, Can you, um, I guess you could always uh, take it the stream and like, make your own copy of the song if you want to, but that's not something iTunes does. <laughs> They would be responsible for Yeah, they would be responsible for it. I, yeah, I don't think they'd be responsible, but it does let you break the law. OK, and what about, um, what about if you have your boombox out in uh, Harvard Square and you're listening to music really loud? Is that against the law? It's public? Or like if you have an a cappella, you know, a singing group, and you go out there and sing a Beatles song? You don't, you're not paying the Beatles anything, but you go out there and sing, you know, All My Lovin' out there in Harvard Square. Is that against the law? Ah, OK. So what is the stuff? Basically, you said if you are performing for profit, then. What if you're not getting any money? What if it's just Harvard Square? You got your boombox pretty loud. If you're just covering your costs and not charging people for admission, I think it's. And what section says that? I'll cover up the screen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, section 110. OK. Do people like this one? It's pretty long. Uh, pretty long. Well, very OK. Messy. Yeah, well, this first one is a real problem. This first one is supposed to be for, see, the problem is there's an exemption what's called face-to-face -face teaching. So I could play up here any movie ever, publicly perform it to all of you. Um, if, as long as it's part of legitimate face-to-face -face teaching. But now the schools are like, what about distance learning? We want to have open course. We want to have open courseware. We want to have distance learning where students in, you know, we have students in Singapore can take MIT classes via video conference. Can I? Does the face-to-face -face teaching exemption still applicable? Well, let's look at what the face-to-face -face teaching. Well, here it is. Number one. Notwithstanding the core rights, the following are non-infringement of copyrights. One, the performance or display of a work by instructors or pupils in the course of face-to-face -face teaching activities of a non-profit educational institution in a classroom. In a classroom. OK, so the Singapore MIT Alliance says, well, how about us? You know, Singapore, it's not really within a classroom anymore. It goes all across the entire world. So Congress is like, OK, we're going to pass the TEACH Act which is a, a whole another complicated regime having to do with distance learning. That, um, that's probably number, it gets very complicated here. But there's all these exemptions for that. And open courseware, I think, is not covered by the Teach Act because it's not part of an instructional regime. So open courseware has to go and get copyright clearance for everything they put on open courseware. And uh, they spend a lot of time on that. OK. Are they applicable to other countries? Hmm. Well, there's a service called what is it? MP3.ru. Do people know this one? Yeah. It's um, all of MP3.com. Has anybody ever used all of MP3.com? You've seen it. It looked dubious. <laughs> Apparently, it has really good quality music, and it's so cheap. And it's in Russia. Um, <laughs> but um, it's, it's probably not illegal for Americans to buy things from all of mp3.com because the end result is that you end up making a copy of the music on your hard drive in America. And unless you have permission, it's probably against the law. Um, but it's true that things can be very complicated internationally. In fact, there's a prohibition on importing copies. Uh, if you're an importer, and you know if something's released in France, some music CD, and not in America, 
I don't have one here. But anyway, if something's released in France and not in America, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to import 1,000 copies. Uh, that's not OK. That's prohibited. Now, you, there's a, and then there's an exemption to that, exception, to that prohibition that says, if it's in your luggage, it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> it may be for private use. I don't, we can look that up. I think that's. But the point is that but you see how now why the copyright law has to be so long because it's concerned with things like luggage, and anti-skip buffers, and I mean it's concerned with every one of these activities and in, in not in a holistic way. It treats movies differently from music. It treats atlases differently from um, books. I mean it's you know. It, if you have an almanac that has maps in it, is that an atlas? or is I mean, who knows? I mean, the, the Copyright Act re reflects this series of carefully wrought out compromises. And it's not so easy to have some holistic truth, uh, some holistic expression about the whole thing. And that's why it's so long. It's, you know, what is your luggage? Uh, Nimmer has got this whole thing about, you know, that exemption we were talking about. Or there's one in Section 110 about playing stuff in your home. Well, what if you've got your in your car and it's blasting the stereo? Um, that, is that your home? You know, all sorts of questions. So, um, you know, the Copyright Act is pretty rare for a federal law to be concerned with all this minutia, but um, you know, it, it is because it has to be. Um, you know, it has to be concerned about things like is a capacitor a reproduction or not. It, it really the, the the most internal details of how a machine operates are essential to copyright questions. And so, people criticize the Copyright Act. They say this is a you know, we're regulating all information in any way you want to trade in information you know, w with any device, no matter how microscopic, now comes within the purview of the Copyright Act. Does anybody think that that's, that's accurate? Nobody? I mean, I think it's accurate. I mean, I got interested in copyright not because I wanted to go to law school, but because, you know, I wanted to watch DVDs under Linux. And you, you know, well, for reasons we'll talk about in the next class, you can't do that legally. And I started learning about copyright, and I was like, oh my god! And uh, you know, I think I find at least copyright can be very thrilling from an engineering perspective because there's so many little pieces, and they fit together in all these non-obvious ways. And then there's disputes that you'd never think about, and and then there's, you know, I find it it's interesting from an, from a sort of minutia perspective, which of course is not how lawyers like to think about it, but. Um, but no, I think it's true that, that the Copyright Act is relevant to almost anything you do these days because, but with information because computers are um, they're like copy machines. I mean, that's exactly what they do. Everything a computer does is copying. Um, so I mean, how do you build up the integers in set theory? If you got three, how do you make four? You do what? A derivative work? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> just if you want to construct the integers, right? You have to take three and you put it in an ordered pair, and then you make another ordered pair on the outside, right? That's how you make four. So, any operation in formal logic, which is what computers are, is it's about copying. Uh, so, I mean, I'm not saying that's a good way for things to be, but I think that the the worry of the criticizers that this federal law is now applicable to the most minute details of anything you want to do in engineering is is basically true. Um, OK. Sorry, where were we? Oh, section 110. So, oh, OK. So here's all these exemptions. There's the exemption for distance learning, you know, because they have to argue about what is a classroom. And here, there's an exemption for performance of a non dramatic music or literary musical work of a religious nature or display of the work in the course of services at a place of worship or other religious assembly. You can imagine how uncomfortable a judge would be about having to decide. I mean, let's say, um, the, what's the group at MIT, the Campus Crusade for Cthulhu? Mm -hmm. Is anybody in that? I don't exactly know what it is, but it's some sort of qu quasi spiritual group, I think. I mean, is that a place of worship <laughs> or religious assembly? I mean, who knows? Um, I mean, and here's the one about Harvard Square performance of a non dramatic literary or musical work. Otherwise than in a transmission to the public. So we're not talking about a transmission here, just a straight performance, without any purpose of direct or indirect commercial advantage, and without payment of any fee or other compensation for the performance to any of its performers, promoters, or organizers. So when the MIT logarithms go in Kresge and they sing their, you know, to packed audience, it, does that need the permission of any copyright owner? 
Come on. No, yes? No, it doesn't. OK. What if they stick out like, their hat? Oh, what if they stick out their hat asking for money? Well, the, it's if there is no direct or indirect admissions charge. Sticking out the hat's not really asking for money, is it? Yeah. What about asking for donations? So it's optional. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, OK, and here's another one. Five, except as provided in subparagraph B, communication of a transmission embodying a performance or display of a work by the public reception of the transmission on a single receiving apparatus of a kind commonly used in private homes. What are we talking about here? TV. A TV, right? So they're saying you can have a single receiving apparatus of a kind commonly used in private homes. Anybody been to Legal Seafood recently? Yeah. What do they have there right at the bar? What? A TV? A bank of TVs. Is that OK? Oh, let's read it. And then it, paragraph B says, communication by an establishment of a transmission or retransmission embodying a performance or display of a non-dramatic musical work intended to be received by the general public, originated by a radio or television broadcast station. So that means not cable. Not cable. Or if an audiovisual transmission by a cable system, OK, that one could be cable, or satellite carrier, if in the case of an establishment other than a food service or drinking establishment. Now, we're talking about the copyright law here, right? But now we have to argue about food service or drinking. Either the establishment in which the communication occurs has less than 2,000 gross square feet of space, excluding spaces for customer parking and not for anything else. You know, you guys already read this, right? So they're not surprising you. Or the establishment in which the communication occurs has 2,000 or more gross square feet of space, and if the performance blah, 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 is by audio means only, the performance is communicated by means of a total of not more than six loudspeakers, of which not more than four loudspeakers are located in any one room, or if it's by audiovisual means, any visual portion of the performance display is communicated by means of a total of not more than four audiovisual devices, of which not more than one audiovisual device is located in any one room, and no such audiovisual device has a diagonal screen size greater than 55 inches. So this seems pretty minute, right? And it means when legal seafood has more than two TVs in one room, they could be in trouble. At least if they're bigger than 2,000 square feet of space. Yeah, that, because that's in the next section, because there are food service and drinking establishments. Oh, OK, OK. In a food service and drink establishment, so they are in trouble, right? But you walk to Best Buy, and they, they play movies, the same movie and all of their Oh, by Best Buy. Yeah, so, well, you're right. So the. So the Best Buy is totally breaking the law there by having the same thing on more than one television. I said Best Buy is breaking the law by having the same movie on more than one television. I think they can have it on as many, the audio on as many as they want. I, we have to read this more closely. We have to read it much more closely. But um, I think Best Buy is you know, in, in legal jeopardy. Well, they probably have them. Got the rights to rebroadcast it, maybe. So what seems is they got the rights to rebroadcast. Why is that probably of a TV? You think of a TV station? No, no. If they like are playing a DVD or something, like if they or maybe they put it their own content. Maybe they put in their own content. That's true. But if they're doing a TV, why is it almost impossible to get the rights? Who would you have to talk to to get the rights? Oh, all the advertisers. Can the FCC give you the rights? Who owns the copyright on the works that are transmitted over television? Who? He says the, the copyright owner. Who's the copyright owner? Come on. Yes, you do. Lots of different companies, right? The copyright on Seinfeld is owned by who? By AOL Time Warner. Now just Time Warner. The copyright on the NBC News is owned by NBC. The copyright on that Saab commercial is owned by Saab. Um, and it, you don't think that they don't object if you spread on commercials. They, they do. Be, um, no, but if, the point is, if you play a TV station, it's almost impossible to get the rights because you have no idea who to even ask for the rights until it's already been broadcast. Because you don't know what's going to be on. And once it's been broadcast, it's, it's too late. You've already broken the law. They'd be in trouble. Well, they'd be violating the law. Yeah. So when I was at Applebee's in Cleveland, they had a TV, but it was muted. And they had a little sticker on it. It was like, the audio is muted to comply with you know, this part of the copyright law. <laughs> 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 so they, have fewer, they have fewer rights than they 
you were loudspeakers. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I can believe that. Anyway, so. Um, well, I don't think anybody really cares, but um, <laughs> it's definitely problematic. You know, if somebody did care. Um, ooh. And in fact, um, uh, you know, there, there's organizations that, um, for instance, anybody here have an XM radio? Nobody? Yes? OK. And what, do you know what XM has at their headquarters? They have like 100, how many channels is it? I shouldn't have erased this one, but you guys remember it was there. A lot of channels. And how did, if you were designing XM Radio's system, how would you do it? Just forget about copyright. Do you think that they have like a million CDs there, and there's like a library, and like they have to go get the CD? And no, what would you do? Big hard drives. Big hard drives. And you just rip all the CDs, right? Well, that's exactly what XM Radio did. They, uh, they hired this company, uh, a Seattle company called LoudEye, to rip all of the CD, you know, rip 140,000 CDs onto, I think, DAT tapes or some sort of backup tape. And the XM loaded them into their hard drives. And now the DJs at XM Radio can pull up whatever song they want and broadcast it on the air. And um, XM now rips their own CDs. Now, w what's the problem with this? It's a copy. Yeah, they're making copies. And there is an exemption in the Copyright Act. Um, OK, so there's an exemption in the Copyright Act. Let's look at what it says. So you could imagine a situation where you had the rights to broadcast a work like, um, OK, well, first of all, how does a radio station play music? They don't need permission for the reproduction, right? But they do need permission for the performance. And how do they get that? Do they go to every single songwriter? They pay fees to certain organizations like ASCAP. They pay fees to certain organizations like ASCAP. And who is in ASCAP? I think it's artists and songwriters, maybe. Yeah, I think it's American Society of Composers, I think authors and publishers. Um, yeah, and there's another organization called BMI which is Broadcast Music International, and another one called CSAC, which used to be the Society of European Stage Authors and Composers. And who do these organizations represent? Do they represent Britney Spears? Songwriters. They represent songwriters, who generally hold uh, singers in a sort of contempt and, and awe. Because the, the, you know, the songwriters... I mean, my personal opinion is that it's a lot harder to write uh, a song than to, I mean, there's a lot of people who could have sung Baby One More Time, and it would have sounded almost identical. But one guy wrote it. And uh, at least I think that's probably how the songwriters feel about it. But anyway, Britney Spears gets all the credit, even though the songwriter probably gets more money. Anyway, so the songwriters are represented by these groups for purposes of licensing performance rights. And these groups are the most friendly organizations you know, you could ever deal with if you're talking to them about trying to get a license. You, you know, if you're a radio station, you go to these groups and you say, we're a radio station, we would like to broadcast every song. And they're like, great, how much profits are you making? We'll take 6% or something like that. And we're happy to write you a license. And they'll, they'll, do, they'll write you a license for anything as long as you pay them. There's no obstacle to getting permission from these organizations. Um, and radio stations get permission from these organizations. And who else needs to get permission? Nightclubs need to get permission if they're going to have acts. Anybody who has a radio on in public generally needs to get permission, um, unless you're part of that food service or drinking establishment exemption. So if you're, a, you know, if you have a, a TV store and you want to have the radio on or or whatever, you need to talk to these guys to publicly perform. Now these guys have already been paid once by the radio station, which is broadcasting it. Then they get paid a second time by the store that's receiving it in public. Um, so. They take in a lot of money. I think I got their financial returns. They, these two take in like a billion dollars a year in revenue each, I think. I may have that off by a factor. It may be, I think it's a billion a year each. This one's much smaller. 
Uh, but these guys are not friendly at all if you are not trying to buy a license. And they have no hesitation about suing nightclubs. And you know, the nightclubs, you know, every year there's a few nightclubs that are like, we don't need a license from these organizations just to sing the song. That's ridiculous. And then the organizations will sue them, and they always win. These guys never lose. Um, I mean, they're always right. But um, anyway, so they represent basically every songwriter on the planet. Not everyone, but almost everyone. And um, the radio stations pay a fee to these organizations every year. And uh, MIT also has a license from these organizations. Just, do, I mean, do they need one for like the logarithms? You answered this before. Probably not. No. Um, but they have one anyway. I mean, MIT has a radio station, so it, it would cover that. Um, so MIT pays money to these organizations. Uh, but does that cover reproduction of the work? If I want to reproduce Britney Spears' song and I have permission from ASCAP, is that enough? Who else do I need permission from? From Britney Spears or her record label. And also, I still need permission from the songwriter to reproduce the work. Uh, these organizations only cover performances. But you can imagine if I want to make a top 10 list, if I'm a record station, I want the top 10 countdown. Uh, I shouldn't have to get permission from everybody to reproduce the song just to make the top 10 countdown, right? Or at least this is what the record stations would argue. They say, we should be able to make a program in advance that has all these songs queued up on it. And then we just pop it in and we play them. That's not really any different than um, just playing them off the CD directly. Right, that's what the, rec the radio station said. They said it's the same thing. But they didn't make this argument to the courts. They made the argument to Congress. And Congress is like, OK, since it seems to be in the spirit the same thing, we're going to make a special exemption for you. So that's one way in which the, it's the same thing argument can succeed if you persuade Congress. So made, they made this law that says, um, notwithstanding the core rights of copyright, and except in the case of an audiovisual work, so it doesn't cover motion pictures, it is not an infringement of copyright for a transmitting organization entitled to transmit to the public a performance or display of a work under a license. So like somebody who already has an ASCAP license. Um, da, 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 da. It, it's OK for them to make no more than one copy or phonorecord of a particular transmission program, like a top 10 list, embodying the performance or display if, A, they keep it to themselves and don't give it to anybody else, B, it's used only for their transmissions within their local service area. And C, unless it's preserved just for archival purposes, the copy is destroyed within six months from the date the transmission program was first transmitted to the public. Those are the three conditions. So now let's go back to XM Radio. Are they in the clear? Oh, can I make the text bigger? Sure. Are they destroying their copy within six months? So the question is, are they destroying their copy within six months? I, I think that the answer is no. Can you destroy the copy and then re-rip it? Yeah. I think the answer is yes. But I don't think XM is doing that. We can ask them. But I think the answer is no. Sirius, by the way, does the exact same thing. They also hired this company, LoudEye, to do the exact, you know, very similar thing. And I don't think that they're, I mean, I don't think they're hiring LoudEye every six months to re-rip them. So, um, I mean, it's a lot of work to rip it. You've got to scan the barcode and put it in. I mean, it's not easy. So I don't think they're re-ripping every six months. Now, what's another possible problem you could have here? Yeah, more than one copy would be a problem. Well, the, another problem is that this applies to a particular transmission program embodying the performance or display. And uh, when they're ripping it, you know, are they really making a copy of a program at that point? They're not making the copy of the top 10 list at that point. And this is more for if you say, we're going to have, we're going to make the top 10 list. And that's going to be our program. But ripping it, it's more like we're going to rip every song by itself. And then maybe later we'll assemble them to the top 10 list, or maybe we're not going to. Um, and in fact, we can look at what transmission program means. Which is like what my entire master's thesis was on. 
a transmission program uh, is a body of material that as an aggregate has been produced for the sole purpose of transmission to the public in sequence and as a unit. That's a transmission program. So, yeah, it's, so it's like if you have the top 10 list. It's a body of material, those 10 songs, that as an aggregate have been produced for the sole purpose of transmission to the public in sequence, the whole top 10 list, and as a unit, the whole top 10 list. So now what do we think about XM's ripping? Are they making transmission programs? Well, don't answer too quickly. Well, OK, answer quickly. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't, it doesn't, seems not really what Congress had in mind. Uh, now, this was very relevant to me because in 2003, um, or more like 2002, my friend Josh and I realized that MIT had these licenses from ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. And we were like, we should create an audio on demand service so that people at MIT can listen to whatever song they want on demand. Um, and we're going to use these rights to public performance from ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC to do that because they let us perform whatever we want. Um, now, did we need Britney Spears' permission to do that? No. Why not? Because, the, because sound recordings don't have any general exclusive right of public performance. It's only digitally. The only time that there's a digital analog distinction is about performances. And the distinction is that sound recordings, for an analog transmission, there's no exclusive right. But for a digital audio transmission, there is an exclusive right. So if we were going to be making a digital transmission service, we would need Britney Spears' permission or have to resort to some exemption. But we weren't doing that. Um, we were going to make an analog transmission service using the analog cable television lines at MIT. Um, so we said, we don't have to worry about Britney Spears, because radio stations don't pay Britney Spears. They just pay ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. Those organizations just represent songwriters. So we said, OK, we're going to be just like a radio station, and, and you're going to be able to call in and say, um, please play me this song, and it'll play for you on demand, except instead of a person there answering the phone, it's going to be a computer. And instead of one radio station, there's going to be 16 of them. But other than that, it's the same thing. That's what we said. Um, now, are there any problems with this so far? Cop copyright law speaking wise? CDs. We're not copying. Well, let's say we're not copying them yet. I haven't said that yet. Uh, over the cable TV channel. So you tune to channel 65, and it would you you listen to the song. So you'd go on some website and you say, "Play me this song," and they'll say, "Okay, now playing on channel 65." And then you tune there with your TV and you listen to it. Yeah, I mean this is now an operation, but that's how it works. So. So ha have I said anything yet that would be breaking the law? No. No. OK. So, um, so then we were like, OK, great. How do we get this music? So what would be the, mo the option most likely to be co legal? Yeah. Question. I mean, uh, what? traditional radio is not on demand, right? Correct. Traditional radio is not on demand. So is there a distinction there in the law? Well, we read section 106, right? Was there a distinction? And these ASCAP licenses don't make any distinction. They, these guys are so friendly, they don't care. As long as you pay them, you can do whatever you, the hell you want, as long as it involves performing the music and only performing the music. So th these guys don't care if you have an on-demand show or whatever. OK, so I haven't said anything that's breaking the law yet, I don't think. Um, now, by the way, is, it a, is the MIT cable TV system, is that a public performance? It's a, yeah, in on-command video, they had a performance on the closed-circuit TV channel to one hotel customer. And they said what? They said hotel customers are members of the public. So it is a public performance. Because anybody can come in and get a hotel room. What about MIT dormitories? Can anybody come in and get accepted to MIT? No. So maybe you could say that it's not a public performance, but I don't. probably you wouldn't win. Although I did make that argument. But... <laughs> Uh, anyway, so but MIT has these public performance licenses, so we're gold. Okay, so what would be the most legally likely way to do this? So you got the person's TV here. It's hooked up to the cable TV system, and they've got their computer that they're using to dial in to our website to say, um, 
play this song to me. Now, how should we actually play the song? Then we've got some TV transmitters here that actually connect to the cable TV system. And how should we get the audio to the TV transmitters? Some CD player. Well, let's say we want to have 2,000 CDs available. How should we do it? 2,000 CD players. 2,000 CD players. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can, like, you only have 16 channels. So you could have 16 CD players. And then how would you hold the 2,000 CDs? They use CD get a CD changer that can put an arbitrary 16 CDs out of 2,000. They actually they make that. And they're, um, they're really big. And they're so awesome, because they have like a robot arm. And they're like, meep, 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 and then it puts it in. And they're really cool. And they, <laughs> they cost um, upwards of $120,000. Um, but, <laughs> well, could we rent it like forever? I mean, I mean, we, it's, pr I mean, generally when you rent electronics, they make it that the, if you rent it for four months, it's the same price as buying it. So probably renting it would not have been feasible either. So this I thought was a great option, but would have been really expensive. So option two, um, is just let's just rip all the CDs and pretend that we have this jukebox, but actually they'll just be ripped. Um, and I this was in my my junior year, I guess, and I argued to the MIT Intellectual Property Council that it was the same thing. <laughs> um, I can pull that up, but uh, that was my argument. And um, lawyers don't actually say no. By the way, they say we'll get back to you, and then like six months later they send you a bill, although I didn't see the bill, but they, and then they're like, for various reasons, it's not clear. Um, <laughs> but anyway, the, the, basically the answer was no. And um, so then, um, in the fall of 2002, we came across this great company in Seattle called Loudi. <laughs> and we called them up. We said, we're going to do this project. And um, we would like to, we understand that you have the rights from the sound recording companies to sell us this music just already on a hard drive, already ripped, and that you've got the permission to do that. And they said, yes, exactly. In fact, we are the supplier for uh, the iTunes Music Store and the a at the, there's a service then called Press Play, uh, which I think has become Napster now, and Duet. And they said, we're the supplier for all those companies. We have deals with, um, they said, we have deals with three of the record labels to, um, at that time there were five record labels, now there's four. But they said, we have deals with three of those record labels to um, just sell you a copy of the music. And uh, on a CD in MP3 format, and then you'd have to negotiate your own deal with the other two companies. And we're like, okay, great. Um, and they were like, and by the way, you have to promise us that if we get sued, you'll defend us. That's what Loud Eyes said. <laughs> and I was like, okay, whatever, I believe you, no problem. So, but MIT, they went to the lawyers, and they were like, we'll think about it for six months. And then they were like, no, because so that process where you promise to defend somebody they get sued is called indemnification. And MIT has a policy that they will never indemnify anybody, which is a wise policy. But uh, I was eventually so desperate that I was like, look, just I will personally indemnify Loud Eye Incorporated. Let's just get this done. But they didn't go for that. Maybe because my indemnification wasn't really, I don't have enough money to really pay anything. But anyway, so. So eventually, uh, MIT's lawyers and their lawyers talked. And their original lawyer had a nervous breakdown. I'm not making this up. And so they got a new lawyer who had credentials in the music industry. And she was very cool. Oh, and at one point, we asked, um, now it's good that you, rep that you know, so they were promising in this contract that they had permission from the Britney Spears, from the record labels, from three of the five. But they didn't say anything about permission from the um, songwriters. Now, did they need permission for the songwriters to do what they were doing? Yeah. And we said, I said, well, what about from the songwriters? And they said, oh, no, 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 no. That's not necessary. We sold music to XM without that permission. We sold it to Sirius without that permission, and Apple, and all these companies. We have never needed that permission. Uh, it's just not part of the law. And I said, well, I'm not a lawyer, but I think it is part of the law. I mean, you're making a copy of their music. Oh, somebody's signaling. I don't know what they're saying. What is it? Oh, OK. OK, we've got to finish up. OK, give me a second. Anyway, well, I'm going to have to finish the lamp story later. But the end result is that they did not actually have any permission from anybody. 
and uh, they got in big trouble, and we got in smaller trouble. And uh, I'll finish up in the next class. Sorry about that. Okay, if anybody has any further questions, don't hesitate to email me.